Welcome to a live BYU devotional broadcast. Today, Justin Dyer of BYU Religious Education will address the campus community. The devotional originates from the Marriott Center on the BYU campus. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to our campus devotional this morning. We are privileged to have W. Justin Dyer, a professor in religious education, as our speaker today. We extend a warm welcome to his wife, Aislinn, and several of their family members and friends who are here with us today. We hope you will join with us two weeks from today for a campus forum when we will have the opportunity to hear from Brent W. Webb professor of mechanical engineering and former academic vice president at BYU. Professor Webb is this year's distinguished faculty lecturer, the most prestigious recognition that is awarded at BYU. We invite you to come and hear from one of the most dedicated and gifted faculty at BYU. It will be well worth your time. Our BYU devotionals are such an important part of our uniqueness at BYU. They provide us as students, faculty, and staff with an opportunity to blend the sacred elements of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ with elements of our academic disciplines. Devotion, devotionals help each of us to develop our full divine potential, which is central to all that we do at BYU. BYU strives to emit a unique light for the benefit of the world, a light that will enable BYU to be counted among the exceptional universities in the world and an essential example for the world. I love that each of you has made it a priority to participate in our devotional today. This morning's prelude was provided by Samantha Keim, a senior organ performance major from Hillsboro, Oregon. Rosie Osborne, a senior majoring in choral music education from Kelso, Washington, led us in singing the opening hymn. The invocation will be offered by Megan Gale, an instructor with BYU Independent Study. Immediately following the opening prayer, we will be pleased to have an instrumental duet performed by Lizzie Thorup, a junior studying in viola performance from Taylorsville, Utah, on the viola, and Molly Smith, a junior majoring in music from South Jordan, Utah, on the piano. They will perform More Holiness Give Me. Now the sister, now the prayer by Sister Gail. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful to be here in this BYU devotional today to listen to Justin Dyer. We're so very grateful um, to be able to gather as a university on this beloved campus and for the education that we're able to receive here. We ask thee for thy spirit to be with us, that we can be led and guided by thee, and that we can become more like thy son, Jesus Christ, and be disciples of him. We love him, Father, and we're so very grateful for all the blessings thou dost give us. And we say these things humbly in his name, Jesus Christ, amen.
Thank you, Lizzie and Molly, for your beautiful and inspirational performance this morning that has so beautifully set the tone for our meeting. We are pleased to have W. Justin Dyer as our speaker today. Dr. Dyer is a professor in religious education. He received his bachelor's degree in marriage, family, and human development from BYU in 2004. He then earned his master's degree and a PhD in human development human and community development from the University of Illinois, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, after which he was a postdoctoral fellow at Auburn University. Dr. Dyer joined the faculty of the BYU School of Family Life prior to becoming a professor in religious education, where he currently teaches the Eternal Family course. Brother Dyer and his wife, Aislinn, are the parents of six children. Brother Dyer currently serves as bishop in his home ward, and he enjoys hiking with his wife and playing his guitar to his children as they go to sleep. Following Dr. Dyer's remarks, the benediction will be offered by Lorenzo Shakespeare, a junior biostatistics major from Provo, Utah. And now we will be pleased to hear from Dr. W. Justin Dyer. Oh, it's wonderful to be here today. Forty-seven years ago, my grandfather spoke at a BYU devotional. Twenty-two years ago, my father spoke at a BYU devotional. And today, it appears to be my turn. You can imagine how nervous this makes my kids. And I was trying to come up with a scripture that might explain this pattern. The only thing I could come up with was something about God cursing families to the third and fourth generation. So let's hope despite the possibility of a family curse, the message I share can be a blessing to some. I've had the opportunity to teach many classes at BYU, but the eternal family is one of my favorites. I've come to a greater and greater appreciation of the blessings of the restored gospel. It's a very personal class, and I've also come to know some of the burdens students bear, particularly as they strive to live a religious life that reflects the teachings of Jesus Christ. We've all felt burdens of discipleship, learning how to forgive as the Savior would, struggling to maintain good religious habits that can get lost so quickly, feeling like you're not measuring up and keeping the commandments, wondering if you ever will. Today I would like to talk about bearing religious burdens. In many ways, I think this talk is for a younger version of myself, one who is newly experiencing some of these burdens seeing others struggling, and wondering whether bearing the burdens of living the religious life are really worth it. Some see religious burdens as harmful. There are books entitled The God Delusion and How Religion Poisons Everything. Many have argued that religion is long past its usefulness if it ever was useful and encourage us to abandon its burdens for a better, freer, more advanced life. These voices seem to be getting louder, and we see some people following them away from religion. Yet Jesus taught that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But clearly the Savior experienced many difficulties. There must have been something about his burden that he chose to hold to it, even when tempted with all the riches and kingdoms of the world. What is it that makes bearing Christ's burden worth everything? First, we should understand that everyone must carry a burden of one form or another. Every choice is imbued with burden, and we decide what is worth carrying. Students, you have chosen to carry the burden of attending college, but there's a different burden if you had chosen not to attend. Studying for an exam is a burden, but we all know that binge-watching a show rather than studying brings its own burden. Each choice we make is accompanied by burden. Jesus asked the rich man to put down his burden of riches and take up Christ's burden. Jesus said, sell whatsoever thou hast, take up the cross, and follow me. Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard noted, one bears a yoke of iron, another a yoke of wood, a third a golden yoke, a fourth the heavy yoke, but only the Christian bears 
the yoke that is good. And that the Christian's yoke or Christ's yoke is good or light seems to mean more than it simply weighs less than burdens of iron or wood or gold. Christ's burden isn't simply less bad than other burdens. In my experience, his burden is light because when we take it up, we bear it with Christ and his grace, his enabling power comes to us. We must have faith in the Savior to see this. Kierkegaard said, have faith that the yoke is good for thee. This good yoke is Christ's yoke. President Russell M. Nelson said, making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. Each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts and in temples and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ. The choices we make are our burdens. And through faith in Christ, we can choose the light ones. But some experiences we have seem to suggest that religious burdens are at times crushing rather than enabling. Probably all of us know some who assume the burden of religious life is on the whole harmful. When I started teaching the Eternal Family, I was often asked how Latter-day Saints' mental health compared to those of other faith traditions or those of no faith. So for the past seven years, I've turned my research to studying this. Some research had already been done, but there was still a lot we didn't know. My colleagues and I have crunched data on hundreds of thousands of people, including Latter-day Saints, non-Latter-day Saints, those who are religious, those who are non-religious, in Utah, around the United States, across sexual orientations and gender identities. With our work and the work of others, an important picture has begun to emerge. Now, it's so important to know that general trends found in research should not be used to dismiss anyone's personal experience. We should recognize and empathize with whatever experience a person has. However, recognizing these general trends has helped me understand my own experiences living my religion and provided me with a few insights into what choosing Christ's light burden means. Research on religion and mental health goes back 120 years. We've been looking at this for a long time. And the evidence amassed since then is rather clear. Attending religious services and engaging in other religious and spiritual practices are, on average, related to better mental health. They're also related to more volunteering in the community and, in general, better physical health. They're related to greater family happiness, better parenting, and lower likelihood of divorce, particularly when family relationships are seen as divine and connected to God. A global study also found, to the surprise of the researchers, that men who are more religious do more housework, something not bad to consider when choosing a spouse. The reality is that research on the whole shows religious people better off across nearly every conceivable domain. And this seems to be more than just correlation. Berkeley researchers conclude that the accumulated evidence makes a compelling case for a causal link between religious and spiritual practices and good mental health. What about LGBT individuals who may be a particular concern given we know they have higher rates of mental health difficulties? And I'm using LGBT to mean all sexual and gender minority experiences. How might religion be related to their mental health? Although the research is somewhat more nuanced, taken as a whole, studies suggest that, just like in the general population, LGBT individuals who have greater connections to religion or spirituality, on average, have fewer mental health difficulties. You're probably aware that mental health problems have soared in the last few years while religious and spiritual practices have plummeted. The obvious question researchers began asking is whether these trends are connected. Harvard professor Tyler Vanderwill and his colleagues estimated that nearly 40% of the increase in the suicide rate could be attributed to the decline in religious service attendance. Now, this is a very important and telling research finding. At the same time, 
And perhaps this is particularly felt by those of us whose lives have been touched by the suicide of a loved one. We do not want this to be oversimplified. There are so many aspects of suicide to consider. If anyone is struggling, please reach out and let others help lighten your burdens. What about research, specifically on Latter-day Saints? My colleagues and I recently conducted a review of every study on Latter-day Saint mental health published in the last 20 years. It probably won't surprise you that Latter-day Saints tend to be a highly religious group, engaging more in their religion than almost any other group. And that seems to translate into good things. Although this research area is still new and much more work needs to be done, studies generally find Latter-day Saints have just as good and often better mental health than those of other religions or no religion. And let me mention that research suggests Latter-day Saints are also the most honest on surveys compared to other groups. And what about LGBT Latter-day Saints? Large-scale representative studies find that Latter-day Saint LGBT, LGBT individuals had, on average, just as good and almost always better mental health compared to LGBT individuals of other religions or no religion. In talking about this research, let me make just two notes. First, there are instances when religion may not be related to better mental health. We'll talk more about that later. And the online version of this talk will provide helpful sources. Second, when we're looking at this research, it's important to know we're not proving whether the gospel is true. That comes from a witness of the Holy Spirit. The truthfulness of the gospel is not at stake in this research. What is at stake is better understanding what is helpful to people and how we can best serve them. And so it is important to recognize the overall trend that religious people, including Latter-day Saints, have something that is related to better mental health. Yet it can be difficult to reconcile these big picture findings when we know so many Latter-day Saints struggle with their mental health. It's clear we still have a lot of work to do. To understand why religion is generally related to better mental health, we must recognize that all people experience trials. Again, we all carry burdens of one form or another. Paul said, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Our trials are trials shared with the whole human race, whether religious or not. But, Paul adds, God is faithful and will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. When we're connected to God, he provides a way to bear the burden. Amidst all the burdens we can choose, when we have faith to choose the Savior's light burden, God bears us up. There are many ways in which religion can help bear us up. Three I want to emphasize are a community of covenant caring, an eternal perspective, and divine patterns of living. First, religion provides not just community, but a community of covenant caring. When his people wanted to come into the fold of God, Alma the elder said they must be willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to bear one another's burdens that they may be light. To a large extent, God's fold, his church, is about taking on the burden of making our brothers and sisters' burdens light. President Nelson says, everyone has pain somewhere. And our challenge is to find out where the pain is. Usually it's not physical pain, but comes in the stress of living. This is what we try to teach the missionaries. When you meet someone, find out how we can help them. The church literally has the capacity to help people no matter what their problem is. The gospel exists to help people. The church's general handbook outlines many aspects of our covenant caring responsibility, including the church encourages families and members to reach out with sensitivity, love, and respect to persons who are attracted to others of the same sex. Are there church members who treat others poorly? Tragically, there are. But true religion calls us to lighten burdens. As President Nelson said in our last general conference, charity compels us to bear one another's burdens rather than heap burdens upon each other. 
we must choose the light burden of lightening others' burdens and at the same time allow others to lighten our burdens. Along with a community of covenant caring, an eternal perspective that religion provides can lighten burdens. When Joseph Smith pled in his suffering and for the suffering saints, God comforted him with eternal perspective, saying that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. And if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. The Lord helped Joseph see past the immediate suffering to a glorious future. Suffering is a burden. But when we can't see past the immediate suffering, it's doubly heavy. Kierkegaard gives an analogy of a rich man driving a lavish carriage at night with lamps all around. He can see what's right in front of him, but his lights blind him to the stars. Yet a poor peasant with no lights has a splendid view of the heavens. And so Kierkegaard concludes, those like the rich man would do away with this notion of eternity and eternal blessedness altogether and would teach men to surround themselves with the greatest brightness possible in things temporal till it become impossible to see eternity at all. My friends, you have the blessing of learning the best knowledge this world can offer, but never let it blind you to the light of heaven. We may feel claustrophobic relying on our own limited light, seeing only the heavy burden right in front of us. Choosing an eternal perspective helps lift our burdens. Along with a community of covenant caring and an eternal perspective, religion offers divine patterns of living, commandments and covenants. These divine patterns enable us and keep us from the heavy burdens the natural man would have us carry. You won't be surprised to learn that religious people, particularly Latter-day Saints, are less likely to drink, smoke, use drugs, and less likely to have unhealthy sexual behaviors. The patterns of the BYU Honor Code are a burden to many. My wife signs me up for church media casting, hoping I'll get a part as some kind of Welsh pioneer extra so I can grow my beard. <laughs> More seriously, aspects of the law of chastity embedded in the Honor Code are a light burden, especially when we realize that the CDC reports that one in five Americans has a sexually transmitted infection and young adults it is your age group who bear the brunt of this crushing burden. This is to say nothing of the other difficulties that come from non-committed sexual relationships. Research finds that the more sexual partners one has, the greater their risk of developing mental difficulties and substance abuse. And regarding the word of wisdom embedded in the Honor Code, last year the CDC found that over half of all people involved in serious or fatal road accidents tested positive for drugs or alcohol. A few years ago, Columbia University produced a report entitled, Wasting the Best and the Brightest, a grim pun on the alcohol tragedy at U.S. universities. Choosing the light burden of the honor code puts you in one of the safest places physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Of course, BYU students who follow the honor code still struggle with their own trials. But there is a profound blessing attending a university that unabashedly chooses the light burden of religion. Choosing to live divine patterns does bring a burden of accountability to those patterns. At BYU, we can always discuss how we manage that accountability, but there must be accountability or there is no commitment. And without commitment, the honor code is of no benefit. I'm grateful for accountability to my religion and BYU because it reinforces what I myself most desire. The burdens freely chosen are light because they help me become who I truly want to be and who the Lord would have me be. 
At this point, let me mention some instances when religion may feel heavy. Sometimes we may carry this light burden heavily. The first is when we are religious simply to avoid something bad. We don't want to disappoint someone or we want to avoid criticism and shame. When we're religious simply to avoid something bad, we live our whole lives like the terrified Bilbo Baggins when he anxiously snuck into the mountain trying not to wake the dragon. But when we are religious because it's important to us, because it's part of our identity, because we value it, and we love the Lord and the opportunities religion gives us to lift others, then the burden is light. Religion may also feel heavy when we think of it as being transactional rather than transformational. When it's transactional, we see ourselves putting our religious acts into a spiritual vending machine and expecting the instant proper payout. We may get angry and start kicking at it when it seems the old spiritual blessings have gotten stuck and don't appear. The burden is light when we see religion as transformational, thinking of our religious acts as helping us little by little, line by line, to become more like the Savior. We may also experience religion as heavy when we feel it is wrong to experience doubts. Doubts will come to many of us at one point or another, and when we see them as opportunities for growth, the burden is light. Religion can also feel heavy when we see God as cruel rather than compassionate, impersonal rather than personal, apathetic rather than sympathetic, or when we feel he is out of reach rather than near at hand. These feelings may arise from our experiences. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland taught that a young person's developing concept of God centers on the characteristics observed in that child's earthly parents. A few years ago, a woman in my ward shared the following in sacrament meeting, and I share it with her permission. She said, one of the most pervasive things I remember from living with my father is his sternness and temper. I never felt completely safe with him. I loved my dad, and I knew he loved me, yet I experienced fear when he was around. For many years, I saw Heavenly Father the way I saw my own, someone who for the most part kept his distance and was easily disappointed and frustrated with my weaknesses. The sister then described what she did to help make this heavy burden light. She said, I have asked God many times to show me who he really is and to help me shed all my misconceptions and false beliefs so I can experience the real him he has responded with patience and love beyond my expectations. He has taken me by the hand, and I am slowly learning to trust that he is not distant, but right here next to me. He is slowly walking me out of fearing him and into the saving power of his love. Our experiences may influence how we see God and religion, but when we come to know and experience God's true, infinitely loving nature, the burdens become light. Religion may also feel heavy when we believe we must live it perfectly rather than patiently. President Nelson said, be patient with yourself. Perfection comes not in this life, but in the next. Don't demand things that are unreasonable, but demand of yourself improvement and you let the Lord help you through that, he will make the difference. To be impatient with ourselves is to bear the light burden heavily. When we choose to be patient with ourselves and others, the burden is light. While it is unhealthy to have a perfectionist demand of ourselves, we must recognize that the light burden of religion stretches us in healthy ways. We will feel the strain on occasion, and that's good. We're growing. Don't run away from it. But we do need wisdom and the spirit to know where to place our efforts. Remember King Benjamin who said, and see that all these things are done in wisdom and order, for it is not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength. There will come times 
when we are not sure just how to carry the burden of religion lightly rather than heavily. There's a story written about 350 years ago entitled The Pilgrim's Progress. It's an extended allegory in which a man named Christian has a great burden on his back and try as he might, he cannot shed it. Then a man named Evangelist tells Christian that he must get on the path to the celestial city. As Christian enters the path, he sees the cross and his heavy burden falls off and he takes up the burden of the path and has many adventures on his way to the celestial city. At one point, Christian comes to a fork in the path. Both ways look just the same. He sits confused, not knowing which is the way to the celestial city. Then a person in bright, shining clothes greets him and tells him that he knows the way, and Christian gratefully follows. Then all of a sudden, this person captures Christian in a net and leaves him for dead. But someone from the celestial city happens upon Christian and frees him. Christian wonders what he did wrong. He followed someone he, who seemed to know the way. The person from the celestial city says that Christian had followed the flatterer and reminds Christian that he had been given a note that would have directed him at the fork in the road. Christian was given everything needed, but he had forgotten us. Most, if not all of us, will come to a fork in the path, a choice in how we live our religion. Either path will lead to a burden. The question is, which one leads to the light burden, to Christ's burden? May I suggest three notes to guide us to the celestial city? The documents, the living Christ, the testimony of the apostles, the bicentennial proclamation, the restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the family, a proclamation to the world. These three one-page documents are the united voice of Christ's apostles, the first presidency and quorum of the Twelve. The living Christ teaches us who Jesus is of an, and of his infinite gift to us all. The Restoration Proclamation teaches us of the Savior's restored church and his preparations for his second coming. And the Family Proclamation provides his teachings to guide us in our family life choices, some of the most important choices we will ever make. These three documents are a sure anchor for our choices as we live a religious life. When you are unsure which way to go, take these out and they will lead you to choose the light burden. President Nelson said that this path is rigorous and at times will feel like a steep climb, but he reminds us of the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual, and if they hold out faithful to the end, they are received into heaven. Again, the difficulties we face are common to mankind. Many of the mental difficulties we experience come simply because we live in a fallen world and our bodies are subject to physical and mental sickness and come through no fault of our own. If we experience such difficulties, we should be careful not to label ourselves as worthless or less than or just somehow weak. Please don't hear me saying that if you were only more religious, you wouldn't have mental health challenges. But please do hear me saying that we must recognize the wonderful blessings within religion, even with all the imperfections of the people in it. Do hear me saying that we should rejoice for Christ's church has come and we should not let our hearts be troubled or be afraid. Christ is faithful and has blessed us with a church designed to help us bear our burdens. The church is a manifestation of the love Jesus offers us and the grace that so fully he proffers us. Knowing of his infinite love can persuade us to move forward with infinite hope. As Kierkegaard said, in the thought that God is love is held the whole blessed persuasiveness 
of the eternal. All choices bring burdens. Aligning our choices with Christ, his church, and his apostles is the light burden. If I were to talk to my younger self, newly trying to sort all this out, I would say to hold on to religion's light burden with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. Taking on Christ's burden is worth more than all the riches and kingdoms of the world. To bear the name of Christ is a choice to have faith in him and to yoke ourselves with he who bears our burdens, our sins, our sorrows, our griefs. It is a choice to allow him to do for us what he offered to ancient Israel. He will bear us on eagle's wings and bring us home. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful and humbled to have had the opportunity to gather together and hear the words of Brother Dyer. We are grateful for his example and the words that he has spoken to us. We pray at this time that as we go forth to serve, that we will, that thou wilt bless us with opportunities to lift others and uh, refine our our spirituality, that we may draw closer to thee and, and to thy son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful for this university and for the blessings that come with receiving an education. Please help us to continue to have our hearts broken and open to thee, that we will receive thy guidance. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a live broadcast of a BYU campus devotional. The address today was given by Justin Dyer. Find links to the full text, audio, and video of this address within the week at speeches.byu.edu. Don't miss the live broadcast of BYU's annual Distinguished Faculty Lecture. BYU Mechanical Engineering Professor Brent Webb will speak on Tuesday, June 6th at this same time. And download the free BYU Radio app for episodes of the Finding Center podcast, a daily half hour of inspiration and spiritual focus. BYU Devotionals are a production of BYU Broadcasting.